couldn't end up in one publication in the entire United States? Yeah, I was pretty discouraged. I was pretty, I was pretty upset with the entire industry. You know, as you can see, these are these are friends and colleagues, and they all went out of their way to to make sure this image was never seen. A friend of mine is going in for open heart surgery. They're going to be, you know, on the on the operating table for eight hours straight. I don't know what kind of mindset a person needs to, to do that, but I'm glad that there's people that can do that. They can make order out of the chaos of people dying in front of them. People call us vultures or whatever, you know, how can you take pictures of that, blah, blah, blah. Well, we're the ones that witness this stuff for you and you need people like us so that we can start that conversation that you need to have. Whatever is happening there needs to be talked about on, on a, a nationwide level. You're understanding something on a different level that words alone can't, can't quite do. So we had our first child. Our daughter comes out, they kind of clean her up and they, they put her on the incubator scale thing, right? It's uh, extremely emotional. You can't even describe what it feels like to, you know, to be in that moment. And I grab my camera and I pick up my camera to make a picture of her sitting in the incubator and all that emotion disappeared immediately. I robbed myself of that moment. Just because I, I picked up that camera and as soon as that camera touched my hand, it's like a switch, a light switch. There's so much personal baggage you bring along with it. And so you have the four hour investment, you have all the, the thought that goes into the, the one image. And the other image was just a gift that landed in your lap. Print has stood the test of time. We can talk about websites. We can talk about different platforms like Instagram or Twitter, or whatever. There's always going to be something that comes out long and replaces that. So what I would encourage you to do, anybody else that's really invested and really is serious about getting, getting better is start from the beginning so how did you get into photography you know I know you grew up in Omaha what was that like well it was uh at the time it was a pretty kind of small town uh maybe the maybe a population of 200,000 it was it was uh the biggest town in Omaha but it's or in, the, in Nebraska yeah right but uh it wasn't a big town compared to anywhere else, right? Yeah. So I grew up in South Omaha, which is was kind of uh, Polish, Irish, Czech, German, uh, Hispanic, um, and so it was. It was. It was. Uh, it was pretty. It was pretty neat. You know, um, I loved it. I didn't know how how great it was. It was it was a time when um you know if you went to if you went to to get uh whatever fish and chips, right? It was a, you had your special place and if you if you if you went to get donuts, it was like somebody's somebody's own own business, right? It wasn't it wasn't a big corporation. It was all family kind of owned stuff. And it was, it was really a great community. I, I, uh, and the stockyards were there. So there was like, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was an amazing time. It really was. How did you first learn about photography and how did you start doing it? Well, I was, um, I was a junior in high school. I was playing football, American football. And, um, the photographers who would shoot pictures, they invited me to uh, to see how the dark room worked, right? Mm. And I had no idea. Um, and the first time I saw that, I'm like, "Oh wow, this is this is amazing," and this is this is what I want to do. And after that, I didn't really know what um, what it meant to be a photographer or how one even made a living doing that. But I knew that's what I what I wanted to do. Um, what was your first sort of big gig and how did you approach that with little experience? Um, 
so my first uh my first work was just uh for the the high school yearbook mm -hmm. and so i was i was shooting black and white film and you know sporting events or meetings or group photos you know just uh the littlest of things and i wasn't uh I wasn't any good, right? But uh, I th I thought I was great, of course. And um, I didn't know, I didn't even know really what a gig was. Um, I didn't know, like I said, I did, you know, there's, you, you see like portrait photographers where people go to take a family picture, right? Something like that. I, I knew those type of guys were around, right? And the only other type of photography I knew was newspaper photography because I, you know, I'd see the newspaper every day. And that's, and then, then I, you know, I started reading. I, I started reading everything I could. And there wasn't, you know, obviously there wasn't an internet. There wasn't, uh, photography books the, the photography books were very limited right you'd have in the library you might have an ansel adams book or um uh, you know just like some art photography books so gathering that knowledge of what a photographer was a photojournalist i didn't know the word photojournalist um i didn't uh i i, I guess what i'm saying is before I could even get a gig, I had to figure out what type of what 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 a gig would even look like. What I was what I was trying to figure out, right? Um, you gained a lot of notoriety in the '90s for one particular image. It's an image of an Iraqi soldier who has died attempting to pull himself over the dashboard of a truck in the highway of death. The flames have engulfed his body and his vehicle, incinerating his body and fire destroyed most of his features leaving behind this skeletal face he stares without eyes it's it's an extremely haunting image and con conjures such strong emotions can you tell me the aftermath that occurred after the release of that photo and tell me what that was like well it was um it was unexpected it surprised me uh the image itself when i made it um, I just, I, I, it was just, uh, an image of record, right? I just documented this scene and it was, um, it was an incredible scene, right? But what I was thinking, because, you know, there's hundreds of other photographers around, I thought, you know, there must be. There, there must be, you know, scenes like this all over the place that are being uh, captured by photographers, right? And um, that wasn't the case. So that was a surprise to me. Um, and then, uh, and I was part of a, I was there for Time Magazine, but I was part of a pool, right? A, a media pool. So all the members of the media pool um, shared, pooled, shared their work. Um, so all, all, all of Time's competitors had access to that. The New York Times, uh, Newsweek, whoever, right? Yeah. And Reuters was part of that pool. So, um, through Reuters and so the Associated Press, AP was part of the pool that that image um, theoretically would have been available to pretty much any newspaper or magazine in the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, obviously when I, when I realized there weren't many images like that, but there were no other images like that, um, I figured it would, it would be, uh, get a lot of ink you know get a lot of play um and so like three days later i'm flying through heathrow 
and I go to the newsstand and I see that image big, right? In the telegraph, right? And um, I think it was the telegraph. And I just expected to see that everywhere, you know, the New York Times, wherever, right? And so from Heathrow, I went to New York and I, I went straight to the office um, because Life Magazine uh, was was closing that afternoon. And so I went to see the editor of Life Magazine just, you know, to check in and whatever and 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 see their layout, what was going to happen. And so they had that image, a double page spread in Life Magazine. And um, the magazine came out like, like two days later and the image wasn't there. I uh, I talked to a friend who's, who's uh, spouse was the um, very high up at the New York Times and that image was laid out on the front page of the New York Times and the, next to a picture of the president George Bush with his hands in a similar position on the, on the podium they pulled that image they pulled it they didn't run it um, and then I saw an editor from the Associated Press um at a party this is like you know this is all within a week and the editor was praising me for that image you know how wonderful how powerful it was I'm not, I'm not sure wonderful is the right word but um how powerful it was and he said oh well, they they all they all made prints for themselves after it you know came came across, across their desks but they and that's the new york bureau and then they refused to, they, they decided not to send it to any of their member newspapers across the whole United States. So none of the newspapers even had, uh, besides the ones that also subscribed to Reuters uh, content, even had, even had seen the picture. So, yeah, it was whatever. It was surprising, I guess, this is the, is the bottom line. You mentioned in another interview that there's something a little weird about a culture that revels in the violence of GTA and the blood spurting, limb chopping, brain eating horror of The Walking Dead. But you can't handle it when a dead guy shows up on the news. Were you discouraged by everything that occurred with the AP after that photo? Did I say that? That's a pretty good quote. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I said that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was pretty discouraged. I was pretty, I was pretty upset with the entire industry, you know, because, um, you know, as you can see, these are these are friends and colleagues, and they all <clears throat> went out of their way to to make sure this image was never seen. Mm. And then you have to you have to think about why they would, you know, who makes that decision. How is it so universal across the board um, that everybody, every every publication that is <clears throat> supposed to be competing with each other made the same decision? Um, so yeah, it's 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 troubling. Why it couldn't it couldn't it couldn't end up in one publication in the entire United States. United States. Um, it was published, you know, that one time in, in England, and uh, I think it was published uh, by Liberation, I think, in in Paris. But uh, that's all, I, you know, it was published later, you know, six or eight months later, but, you know, at the time, when the narrative, right, the uh, the narrative across the board was how um, um, bloodless this this war was, right? You were relatively young when you covered the first Gulf War. How did that affect you at such an early age? No, I I'd, I'd worked um, I'd worked in other, you know conflict there i worked in belfast um i worked in haiti um other you know 
uh, you know, situations that, that could break ugly. I, I didn't want to be um, a war photographer. At that point, I'd, I'd, done, I'd done some conflict photography and I realized, you know, okay, most of these people, I don't know, I don't know what it's like to uh, grow up in Haiti, for example, right? I don't, I don't, I don't have, I mean, I can, I can, I can make images there, but uh, I'm not as invested in, you know, uh, Haitian conflict and trying to figure out that and trying to, to, that's, 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 that's a deep investment, right? And I didn't have that connection to Haiti, for example, I'm just using that as an example. And, and so I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't interested in trying to, you know, um, risk your life and then, you know, the only images that get published are the sensational ones and you're not really, so, so long story short, I decided that uh, I wasn't going to do that anymore. But then this American conflict is very serious, this, you know, um, because of the, it was a, it was a, it was a true ground war, right? This is like, this isn't a skirmish where, you know, there'll be whatever, a couple thousand troops involved. This was, this was a major ground war um, that could have, could have gone, you know, we didn't know how it was going to go at the time. So. I had to convince, you know, the director of photography at Time Magazine to even, even uh, let me go, you know. Um, and my argument that I should go was that uh, this was this was a huge Department of Defense um, media apparatus that's been set up, right? Um, which means there are a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of politics to deal with. And I had worked a lot in Washington, D.C., so I kind of understood how to to work in that system. And most uh, war photographers, they, uh, there used to be more, you know, uh, getting their own access and not have to, having to deal with bureaucrats and stuff like that, just on, you know, a very minimal basis, right? Because it's it's a uh, it's a conflict area, and, and most of the time nobody's really in charge, or that those those who's in charge is fluid. But this was a situation where I felt you really needed to uh, get some cooperation from from bureaucrats to make it work. Right? Do you struggle maintaining a professional distance from the personal tragedies of war, and if so, how? No. Oh. I don't, I know that's just like, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a blunt statement, but I don't. And, um, you know, so I was thinking about this uh, last night. A friend of mine uh, is going in for open heart surgery on Tuesday. And they're going to they're going to be you know on the on the operating table for 8 hours straight and i'm thinking what kind of a person what kind of a doctor um <laughs> makes makes that their specialty where they're going to like have a person open on the table for 8 hours straight and doing surgery on their heart and i'm like what kind of what kind of uh, mindset to study that hard, to be that competent, to be able to do that? What what kind of person does that? And I'm like, well, I don't know, but I'm glad they exist, right? <laughs> We're we need surgeons that can that can remain professional, that can get the job done, that have studied that know exactly what they need to do and they have the skills to do it. 
and then you, so you take that and you know that 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 idea and you and you and you uh think about photojournalists and you know photojournalists are always like not always but oftentimes um people call us vultures or whatever you know how can you take pictures of that blah 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 and well we're the ones that witness this stuff for you and then deliver it to you because you're going to vote you're going to make decisions on the future of your country whatever country that happens to be most countries right democracies and you need people like us so that we can start that conversation that you need to have and um so i don't i don't know what kind of mindset that that a person needs to to do that but i'm glad that there's people that can do that that can go in to a situation and keep their their mind focused their eyes big they don't get tunnel vision and they can they can make order out of the chaos chaos of of uh, uh of people dying in front of them and capture it in a way that those who see their images can make some type of sense of what's happening there right because whatever is happening there needs to be talked about on on a, a nationwide level right if we're if we're going to if we're going to make life better for those that follow after us if we're going to make good decisions if we're going to um make the best decisions for our country and our and our people so those conversations have to happen and you know um two of the best don don mccullen tom stoddard they could do that right when you go in and look at their images it's like you're understanding something on a different level that words alone or even moving images alone can't can't quite do do you have any particular moments or photos that have really affected you yeah i got affected once i uh i uh so we had our first child 27 years ago my wife and I, and um, and I was, you know, in the in the birthing suite, and so she, our daughter, comes out. They kind of clean her up, and they put her on, they put her on the the incubator scale thing, right? And I, and it's a it's a extremely emotional, um, you know. You can't even describe what it feels like to, you know, to be in that moment. And I grab my camera and I pick up my camera to make a picture of her sitting in the incubator and all that emotion disappeared immediately. I robbed myself of that moment just because I, I picked up that camera. And as soon as that camera touched my hand, it's like a switch, a light switch. So yeah, that that upsets me that I that I didn't absorb that moment as well as I could have. You've had such a successful career, and looking back, is there anything you would change in hindsight? So, like, there's a copy stand behind me there. There's a light table. I've been going through my archive, and so if you looked around this room, you'd see banker boxes of slide pages thousands of slide pages and you know what i what i what i'm seeing is these images that were kind of throwaway images 25 years ago are now some of the most interesting images And so let me give you an example. Like, right, you've got 
whatever, a leader of a nation in a press conference, in a podium, whatever, and you're making the picture that you need to make for your publication. But the stuff to the right or the left of the podium or even behind you seems so much more interesting to me today. And sometimes it's, you know, little things like whatever, uh, an old fashioned TV screen or something. Right. But, but there's, you know, that's just, you know, like, Oh, we don't use those type of TVs anymore or someone on a, on a, a landline phone, right? Oh, we don't use those anymore. There's no cell phones in the picture. Right. But, um, that's on one level, but the other, the other level, the deeper level is, um, just kind of these pictures that are no one special. Um, nothing's really happening in the image, but they capture a flavor, a moment in time. Sounding very cliche here, but something that that uh, that not only doesn't exist, but it's hard to it's hard to uh, Imagine what what that life was back then compared to today, right? I mean, people like to say, you know, if you get a, if you get a good image, and you give it twenty five or thirty years, it becomes a great image. And that's true, you know. It's and 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 it's. So I, I guess to answer your question, I. I would have made more images of the little things, not so much the big things that were going to be published by a major magazine. Those little things seem a lot more, um, a lot more interesting today, I guess. How, how do you think the digital revolution has changed the way you take photos and how has it changed the skills required? Okay. So that's, complicated one um you know in a so i i would i have no desire to shoot film you know i've got there's probably in my office here there's probably 20 film cameras that i have no desire to to pick up and shoot pictures with it just you know it's 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 a tool that served its purpose and um now there's better tools right and so the images the the uh the quality of the images um the uh the options i have with the tools today um the ability to to share them and send them, you know, moments after they're made. There's there's uh, nothing can compete with that, and I I love every aspect of that. Um. So, where where what's the downside, right? Yeah. So there's a there's some there's a there's some major downsides when you talk about the instantaneous part of it. So when you're shooting, you could be you see this at wherever you see it at sporting events, right? If you're watching a sporting event and you look at the photographers on the perimeter of the event, you know. Um, they shoot their pictures and they almost immediately look at the back of the camera, right? And so that seems like a little thing. It seems like an important thing if you're, you know, shooting for the wire services, you need to get that image, you need to know if you have an image, whatever, right? But as soon as you do that, you've taken yourself out of out of the the space that you're in, right? And if you do that, when you're making a portrait of somebody. So you're making a portrait and you're 
you're looking at the back of the camera, there's a subconscious thing that happens there with you and the subject, right? And eventually what it boils down to is the person or the event that you're photographing that you need to be there 100%, right? I don't care if it's a football match or uh, a press conference or street photography. You need to be there 100%. And as soon as you start looking at the back of the camera, you're not there 100%. And even if you're there 90%, it's still not good enough. Um, just like the little things I can critique my, you know, myself 25 years ago. That two to three percentile that you've missed, maybe you've missed something huge like 10%. Anything over two or three percent and you're not in the running anymore. You're not in the competition. That's how that's how competitive, that's how important, that's how um that's the slim margin that that a successful photographer works works with when they're trying to make lasting images. Do you have any boundaries when it comes to photography? You know, is there any photo you wouldn't take or publish? Yeah. Um, so, um, like with street photography, street photography, the concept of street photography is that it's a public space, right? And, um, everybody has, has the right to use that public space as long as they aren't infringing or, uh, you know, threatening the, the other people in that public space, right? So if you, have, if you have a protester and they're peacefully protesting and they're, you know, reading and, you know, with a loudspeaker, normally in most, you know, democracies, that's, that's, uh, that's just normal, right? It's, it's just part of living together in a public space. And so that public space, that idea that I'm allowed to look and I'm allowed to record what I see in that public space because we're all, we're all using it equally. Now, if you invited me into your home, then I wouldn't just start snapping away. I'd be like, hey, do you mind if I make a picture of you? You know, blah, 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 right? Because that's the, you're, you're in somebody else's private space at that point. So what do you do in the case of a mentally ill, a drug addict, or just a, you know, homeless person who's living on the street? Um, now they're, you know, their, 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 their private space and that public space is all mixed up. And so sometimes, depending on the person, right, if it's a mentally ill person and they're homeless, I'm not going to, I'm not going to normally make their picture, right? If I do make their picture, I'm going to try to do it in a way that they might not be identifiable. And I'll have a specific reason for doing that right um but if i'm just out street doing street photography i'm not i guess to boil it down i'm not going to um i'm not going to disrupt somebody in their quasi private space that they're living in and i'm not going to be you know punching down i'm not going to be um I'm not going to be taking advantage of somebody that can't, you know, uh, make a, make a, take care of themselves. Right. Yeah. So there's not, there's, you're not going to prey on somebody, you know, that, uh, that needs some type of help. They don't need you, you know, making a picture so you can put it on Instagram and get likes. Right. There's a way to, 
to tell those stories, but it's not um, just by going in and, and, and blasting away normally. Photographers take photos for multiple reasons, whether it be for artistic purposes or raising questions about power, identity, faith. Why do you choose photography? Why did it? Why did I first choose it? Because I, I thought it was cool, right? And I thought, uh, I thought, like I, I said earlier, I didn't really know what a photographer did. I didn't know if, uh, you know, I thought, I thought, I thought you might. Uh, this is, you know, what I'm, you know, fifteen or so, sixteen. I thought, oh, you go and you shoot the Olympics, and then you go and. Um, shoot a shoot a model for Vogue, and then you go to the White House, and um, then you go to Afghanistan for National Geographic, whatever. Right? I didn't know that those were like different different genres, even categories, whatever. And I didn't know that how uh, specific most photographers were like. Um, there's, you know, a fashion photographer, then there's a beauty photographer. You know, it's like, what is the difference? And so I thought you could just with, you know, your talent and your skills that you could, you could, um, you know, fly around the world and have this uh, glamorous type of thing. When I'm a teenager, right? That's, that's how I started. Because understand, we didn't, we, all we had um, were magazines and newspapers with the actual photography um, in them to like make make a, a, a uh, build this idea, right? And it wasn't like today you couldn't go into um, someplace like Barnes and Noble, order a cup of coffee, and grab twenty magazines off the rack and just page through them as you drink your coffee so we didn't have the internet and to even and we didn't have the photo books were sparse um and to look at a magazine or a newspaper you actually had to buy it and invest in it so you know i might have ten dollars right i'm a kid and I'd go up to the magazine stand and I'd look at magazines and, okay, like Perry Match. I know that's an important photojournalism magazine, but uh, so is Italian Vogue or French Vogue, you know, two completely different genres. And they're a foreign magazine. And so they're, you know, the, the, the cover price might be $2, but it's really going to be $6, you know, because you're in Omaha. <laughs> and so you're like, okay, I'm going to, I've got $10. I got to decide which one of these magazines I can even buy. And so then if you, if you choose Perry match, then you're looking at photojournalism and you're trying to like, okay, you put yourself in the, in the shoes of the photographer. It's like, how did they find themselves there? What kind of, you know, what kind of uh, thought process got them into that place at this time? And how did they decide to stand there? What kind of film are they using? How is that a long lens? Is it a short lens? You know, you dissect every aspect of that. And since you've invested, you know, half of your money in this one magazine, you'd go through it every page over and over again. And then the next time you had $10, you might get, French Vogue, right? And so you do the same thing. And so my idea of what a photographer do was, I, I didn't kind of, I thought it was all the, you know, the same, the same category, the same thing. So I didn't have this idea. I didn't know that if you were a war photographer, um, then magazines wouldn't send you to the Olympics normally, right? So um actually but so so i had this idea that 
you didn't specialize, you did all this stuff. And that's what I did in my career. I did, I did, you know, nine Olympics, I did wars, I did uh, politics. Um, I did, you know, the, the portraits of a people, the portraits of a country, those type of essays, right? So I guess that, you know, to answer your question, this, the idea that I, that I built in my head as a teenager growing up in Omaha, Nebraska, what a fashion, what a, 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 a photojournalist was, um, it probably didn't exist, but I kind of, through, you know, just having this, this kind of wrong idea, I kind of made it happen. If that makes sense. You sort of mentioned it in your previous answer, but if you don't only shoot conflict photography, you also do sports photography. How would you compare them? Are there any similarities? What are the differences? Yeah, so this is the thing, right? When I was growing up in Omaha, Nebraska, the only thing for my for my um, limited perspective, right? The only thing that people would would hire me to photograph was sports. And I was uh, an athlete in college. And so, and I loved Sports Illustrated. I loved, you know, what these guys could do with a, with film and a manual focus camera. It was, it was, these guys were incredible. Um, it was so, Before autofocus, and when you're still dealing with, uh, you know, like I'd shoot the, I'd shoot, you know, outdoor events at the Olympics on Kodachrome 64, right? Um, the idea that, so I became a sports photographer just because that was the only thing I could get jobs to shoot. And I became known as a sports photographer. And that was normally in black and white. And so I'm, once again, I'm a kid, I'm like 17 or 18. And I got in uh, to the offices of Sports Illustrated to, you know, to meet with their director of photography. And I show her a black and white portfolio of sports photography. And not just that, but, you know, whatever I'd shoot. And she's like, this this is a color magazine. You're showing me all black and white, right? So I went from being a sport and she's like, you got to, you got to experiment with film. You got to fill the frame, fill the frame. You can't, you know, cause with newspaper photography, with wire photography, you're shooting black and white and you can crop the image to, you know, you shoot a little wider than normal and you crop the image, right? All that went out the window. So I went from a sports photographer and then I became a color photographer to understand these different transparency films and what they were good for, what you could use them for. And, and I got good at just color photography. And then, so I'm still in Omaha and in the neighboring state, the presidential election in the past, the first race in the, you know, all 50 states would vote separately, the primary. The first one was in Iowa. So I started going to Iowa because I could drive there, right? I didn't have to, I could sleep on somebody's couch and drive there or whatever, get a cheap hotel room. And I could shoot these guys that would, one of them would end up being president. And so I had, the sports photography skills where I could focus and you could, you could isolate action out of chaos, right? Then I had the color photography skills and then I became a political, I became known as a political photographer. And so I went through all these genres and when I was a sports photographer, I'd get sports jobs. But then when I became a political photographer, I didn't get any sports jobs. Um, and then you become a conflict 
photographer, then you don't get any political jobs. Um, the only thing I was never pegged as was a portrait photographer. I always had trouble with portraits because I don't know, I just wasn't, I didn't have that, that ability to interact with people in a really closed set like that, right? Um, so at some point, and so you're, so you're you're trying to make a living, but you have to uh, you know you have to keep calling and banging on doors to to let people know that you know I can do sports, I can do conflict, I can do politicians, I can you know I can do uh, a story on small scale mining in in. Tanzania. Uh, I can, I, I have the skills to do all those things and they all kind of mesh together to, uh, you know, give you a very wide platform. I don't know if that's exactly what you're looking for, but the idea is as a photographer, you should, you should have that wide platform. You shouldn't just be a sports photographer or a portrait photographer this or that because it's 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 no fun and it keeps you fresh it makes you better to always push yourself where in places where you're not necessarily comfortable looking back what skill do you think has helped you the most in your career yeah i don't know what i don't know why this is but for some reason people are comfortable around me and I'm not saying that to uh, like, you know, be braggadocious or something. I'm just, I don't know why it is, but, um, and it, and it's not a language, you know, because it's like language skills. I don't, it, it, it crosses those borders. It, it, it's just, and it's not a cultural thing. It crosses those borders. So normally, and I don't know exactly why it is, but people are just comfortable around me, strangers, and um, and I wish I could tell you what the recipe for that is, but um, it, it just, I don't know, because cameras being photographed is intimidating, right? It makes people nervous. So that ability to just blend in and not have people nervous or acting strange around you. That's, that's my skill, but I don't know exactly how to teach that skill. When you're taking photos, because you're taking photos with such personal stories and every, every photo tells a story and every photo is a different person. Do you ever struggle choosing shots? I do. You know, um, I, I think I'm really good at editing other people's work. And I'm sure you've heard this a million times before, but when it comes to editing my own work, I don't, it's, it's, it, there's so much um, personal baggage you bring along with it editing your own work because what if it took you you know four hours like waiting around to make a to make this image and you know you made the image has exactly how you wanted to make it and then you're editing your stuff and you've got that image next to an image that you just like lucked into right and so you have the four hour investment, you have all the, the thought that goes into the, the one image and the other image was just a gift that landed in your lap. How do you, how do you re remove yourself from that investment that you've made to like say, you know, <laughs> push the one, push the one, uh, uh, push the one to the side that, you know, you thought you were going to love, right? It's hard to do. You've taken so many photos. What keeps you motivated and what advice would you give to any other aspiring photographers? 
So I've never had a staff job. Um, the closest thing to a regular, well, I, I, so in the magazine world, they normally didn't have staff photographers um, in my era. Earlier, like the classic days of life magazine, you had staff photographers who got a salary, right? And so as soon as you get that salary and they give you a car, or they give you cameras to use, they give you film, right? They also uh, ask for your copyright. So I always thought my copyright, the ownership of my own images was important. And so instead of being a staff photographer, I'd be a contract photographer, which means you'd be guaranteed a certain amount of money. Uh, and you, this could be a yearly guarantee. It could be a monthly guarantee. It could, it could be whatever. Uh, it could be for a number of uh, days a year, whatever it was, right? But you weren't a staff photographer. You were a contract photographer, so you kept ownership of your images. Um, so I was, and so I, I don't say this, you know, this isn't, uh, I think that, I think that what, what I saw as a young photographer, the staff photographers for newspapers, because newspapers are normally all staff, um, you know, they, they'd, they'd be these hotshot photographers. Uh, you know, they get out of college, they get their first job, and, you know, they get that second job at a slightly better pay. At some point, they get to a paper that's good enough, and they get, like, they have, like, a five-year run. They have, like, a seven-year run. And then... They're a staff photographer, their job is guaranteed, and they just kind of, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, the, the quality of their work would drop off because they're in that place where they're, they're comfortable and they're happy. And so they didn't have to strive anymore. Um, and so I saw that as a trap, right? They even... The, the the staff photographers would even talk about the golden handcuffs, right? You get that staff job and you know, you don't you don't put the same effort into it. Or you have to you know, you have to clock out at four PM in the afternoon. So if you're working on a story, you stop working at four PM even though the light doesn't get good till six PM, whatever. Right. So there's that was always a trap. And so this idea that I never had a guaranteed in income for the most part, besides the, the guarantees of a contract. And a contract can disappear overnight. Um, that hunger is, is 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 what, you know, paid off for me um, the most always. Never, never, never being comfortable. So never being comfortable, always improving, and then actually owning your work at the end of the day. I think that's what allowed me to, to, to work at a, a certain level for a long time. Um, before we wrap up, I want to talk about your blog series, Talking Pictures. Can you talk about that project and your plans for the future? So I uh, I launched um, I launched a nonprofit and um, because I wanted to I wanted to create this this space where photographers could get printed in a magazine and it's an oversized magazine and they could get properly paid and I wanted it to be like the showcase and. Um, and I wanted to disrupt the industry and with uh, with paying photographers what they're worth and things like this. And so right now it's kind of in hiatus. 
just because we're we're waiting on grants and stuff like this. Um, and so talking pictures morphed into uh, the Curious Society is the name of the nonprofit. And um, so I don't, I, I mean, I don't, uh, I'm just, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of in that, uh, I'm almost waiting now. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm, I'm kind of directional lists now because I am waiting. I don't know what to, I don't know how to get to that next step with this project. So, and that's, you know, and that eats away at me. So I don't, I don't think that really answers your question, but I love, I love talking about photography. I love looking at photography. And I'm not just talking about photojournalism. I love it all. I really do. And I think photographers are just fascinating people, right? Because um, they have to, <laughs> they have to create an image, a still image. They don't have motion. They don't have sound. They don't have smell. All they have is that one brief little moment in time and it's such it's such a nowadays it's such a it's almost well it's it's odd it's 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 obviously it's archaic but it's 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 just so strange and anybody that wants to do that to take that challenge of basically communicating with their fellow humans with a hand tied behind their back in this medium that is in many ways so limiting, right? But when it works, it works forever. And it just keeps getting better. That's, I think that is that's the mystery of photography. That's the, you know, and so to talk to people that are on that, that same journey on that same quest is fascinating to me. Any closing remarks? <laughs> no, I, 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 I appreciate that, uh, that you reached out to me, Stanley. And I, and I, uh, I don't know if you're, uh, I don't know. I didn't, Look, at, I, did you send me your website? I don't think you did. No, my. I my saw your Instagram. Photos. Okay, see, that's even that's even a generational thing. It's like when the internet came out, it's like we would spend weeks and thousands of dollars to design the perfect website, and there'd be, you know, just so ridiculous, um, right? And all that, so. I guess that's my, my closing thoughts, right? It was the reason I wanted, I want the Curious Society had to be in print, right? Because print has stood the test of time. And we can talk about websites. We can talk about different platforms like Instagram or Twitter, or whatever. There's always going to be something that comes along and replaces that. And it's always um, kind of dependent on technology and what we can do with the digital world, right? But with print, once you get it on paper, all you need is, you know, a little bit of window light and you can experience it. And so what I would encourage you to do, anybody else, um, that's really, really invested and really is serious about getting getting better is um, start printing your work. So instead of just like posting to Instagram, take that file, tone it, prepare it for output at whatever, you know, A3, whatever it is, and and make those prints. And you don't have to show them to anybody you just put them in a box, but that process of making those prints 
and I just 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 putting them in a lasting medium that isn't is you know anybody knowing that anybody could open that box 20 years from now and trying to impress somebody that you don't know that you might never know 20 years from now with something that you put on paper that you saw that you witnessed today in your own neighborhood in your backyard wherever i think that's a huge i think that would be a huge uh um learning exercise for anybody today.